Tonight, we're, I want to do less of input. We want to do beginning some pulling stuff together to, we're, we're here to eventually write a covenant. And so this, the discussions we're having on vows and all this is, is kind of a lead up to what we really want to do. Yep. Okay. But again, I want to tell a story for flavor. It's not going to be stories for flavor. I want to tell one story for flavor today. And again, it's a strong story because we're dealing with strong issues, but a good story. This is a story with a happy ending. Okay. Some years ago, I was doing a retreat for some priests, an archdiocese, who were actually diocesan priests, a large archdiocese. And they start on, on Monday night, and then you go till Friday noon. But on Tuesday night, after we had a little session, one of the priests said, come and join our, our, our support group, it's meeting tonight. So I went with him, and then five priests met. And they met in a breakout room, and they had some beer there, and some scotch, and peanuts, and a few things, and so on. But before they got to that, they spent 45 minutes, and they do that every week, five of them, and during these 45 minutes, they each made a searingly honest confession of their last week to the most humiliating thing they'd done in their lives and so on. Then they were telling me about this group. The guy who started was a young priest, was 48. He said, Father, he said, I started this group five years ago. He said, and I started for this reason. He said, I was a good priest, but I wasn't a great priest. He said, I can tell you the reasons for both. He said, I was a good priest. He said. I went to the seminary, I was motivated, I wanted to help people, serve God. And he said, then I tried my best in the seminary, I studied, and he said, then I was ordained, and he says, and I was a good priest. He said, I was initially, I was in a, in a city, you know, young, pa not pastor, but assistant pastor. He said, then the bishop gave me five rural parishes, he said, which was a lot of work, and he said, almost killed me. He said, and I was driving around, he said, but he said, I was generous to a fault, I was just killing myself, you know. He said, the people loved me. They thought it was Francis of Assisi. You know, he's there, and he said it was all over and doing all this stuff and meetings every night and so on. He said, and I really poured myself out for these people. And he said, they loved me. And he said, I was a good priest. He said, oh, I wasn't a great priest, though. He said, um, I wasn't a great priest, he said, because I was doing all this good work. He said, but I'd kept some major compensatory areas in my life. He said, one of them was anger. He said, um, I was ministering, but if it didn't go my way, um, you know, I'd, I'd be in a sulk and I'd be pouting and, you know, I like to work with people who like to work with me, but not with the others and so on. So there was a fault. He said, and then secondly, he said, also, he said, um, I was alone, I was young. He said, and a priest's salary isn't a lot of money. He said, but nothing else to spend it on. He said, so I really jacked up my lifestyle. He said, directory I had every comfort you could buy, every kind of CD and CD player, and my car was loaded with stuff and so on. He said, and I went on really good holidays, and he says, uh, he said, no, and I drank good wine, <laughs> he said, go to a restaurant and get the most expensive steak. So I was tired and all that spend my money. He said, so my lifestyle was escalating, and he says, but that wasn't my major thing. He said, you know how I handled all this tension? He said, and even how I handled my celibacy, he said, I did it through masturbation. So he said, so I had no illusion I was Mother Teresa. He said, I'm doing all this work. And he said, and I've got these compensatory areas in my life. He said, and it changed, or began to change with my father's death. He said, he lived across the, the, the state, and I drove across to bury my dad. He said, he was a very good man. He said, I was driving home. He said, in the car, I was praying. He said, I was crying. And I thought, I want to do this different. He said, I'm going to be a great priest. I want to be a good priest. He said, no more compensations, no more of this stuff. He said, and I naively thought I could do this by willpower. I'm never going to get angry again. I'm never going to do this and so on. He said, and I found it, I couldn't do it. He said, I had to learn what alcoholics learn, that you can't change your life just to willpower. You can only change it through grace and community. He said, you only change your life through grace and community. He said, so what I did, he says, one by one, I called my five or four closest priest friends together. He said, now we do it together. He said, and it works. He said, and we do it. He said, so every week we do his confession, we meet, and he says, uh, and he said, uh, we call ourselves a, a group, he called it, he said, we're a group for radical sobriety. That's good drinking beer. <laughs> okay. uh, sobriety isn't about liquor. It's about transparency of your life, that what people see is what, they, we want people to, what they see is what they get with us, you know? And, and every one of the priests had a similar kind of story. I was a good priest, but I was this and so on. And the youngest priest in the group was only 38. And he said, you know, Father, I just joined this group two years ago. And he said, it's, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. He said, not the confession, it's easy. He said, but to be 38 and trying to live like Mother Teresa, he said, that's hard. 
But he said this, he said, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. He said, and it's the best thing I've ever done. He said, I've never been this happy in my life. Notice the rich young man who turns down Christ's thing, he said he went away sad. He didn't go away bad. <laughs> he came to Jesus as a rich, sad young man, and he went away as a rich, sad young man. Remember, this guy's at a pretty high level of spirituality. Remember, he tells Jesus, I've obeyed all the commandments. I do everything right. He said, what's still missing with me? Jesus says, well, what's missing is you have to give everything, not just part of yourself. And this, this young guy, who uh, his name was Francis, who was uh, uh, the leader of this group, he says, um, he said, I, I look at my, my soul. He said, like, Teresa of Avila says, you know, we're a house with many mansions. He said, and I looked at it this way, that I got a house with 30 rooms, and I'd given 27 of those to God, but I kept three. <laughs> and he says, see, when the rich young man comes to Jesus, he said, I've given up almost everything for you. Now what must I do? Jesus says, well, you've answered your own question. You know, it's those last three rooms. It's that last 5%. You know, the difference between Mother Teresa and most of the rest of us is about 5% of our lives. We've given away almost our whole life for others. Mother Teresa gave away her whole life, you know. And, but the, the part I want to bring the story is I had to learn that you, you can't just change your life alone. He said, it's got to be done through grace, but also through community. He said, you know, it's a lesson that alcoholics learn and so on. They said, to give up any addiction, to live a life of sobriety, of transparency, you can't do it unless you're doing it with other people. See, so that's the introduction I'm going to do tonight, because tonight I'm not going to give a talk. I want, I want to get us involved in this discussion in terms of, uh, remember the original advertising for this is, we want to get together to eventually draw up a covenant, you know, that you go, and I, here I say, a covenant that, that goes across the divide of congregation. We're here from different congregations, different charisms. Grows across the divide of distance. We're here from all parts of this country. We're here from other countries. That goes across gender. Some are men, some are women. And you know, we are in a lot of mixed communities that work. And then, and also the theological and ecclesial ethos, which means it doesn't matter whether you're liberal, conservative, um, for the Pope, or this Pope, or whatever, all of that is incidental. You know, it's, it's um, you know, at, at the core, we have to, you know, name and support each other in our oneness. Every one of these rooms, you've made a commitment, or you wouldn't be in this room. All of you have made religious vows, you committed yourself to, to Christ and stuff through a certain charism, through the church, and so at that that's why you have to talk in the body of Christ. At one point, we're all one. We're all enzymes floating inside the same body. And, uh, um, and part of that is mystical. But remember, I said the other day, we, we have to put skin to this. See, it's one thing to pray for your mother. It's another thing to pray for her and send her a letter. See, so we're <laughs> we support each other mystically inside the body of Christ. This next section is, how do we do that more concretely? You know, so what we want to do is in two sections tonight. Just want to invite you to give some elements. Just and uh, I'll introduce that, and then we're going to pull some of that together tonight. And then tomorrow we'll bring you back a little draft to look at to say like, uh, what do you think of this, and so on. Um, and inside it, there's always two things. One part I think will be easier. Um, the other part's easy too. We just have to, to to daydream and dream enough. But the one part I see. So so a covenant is always this. I want two things. One of them is, what are our core values? So we support each other through prayer, through fidelity. You know, those things are they're sometimes hard to do. They're easy enough to name. And like our founder said, support each other through horizon. Every all make, make a commitment that half an hour a day, you sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament or you're, you're in, in silence and you get in solidarity with others. It's a concrete action. It's an action of, well, but See, we, we, I want you, when we get into, first of all, to name the obvious things. You know how we support each other? By keeping our vows. How we support each other? By praying every day, by being Eucharistic people, you know, by serving the poor, you know. The, so those are, we, we name those core values and so on, and then we commit ourselves to them. See, that's, you're doing it not just for Jesus or your congregation, we're doing it for each other, you know. Um, you know, when you live with people who are faithful, it's a lot easier to be faithful. When you live with people who are acting out, uh, it disorients you. 
And if you're not careful, pretty soon you're going to start acting out. You know, we either support each other or we drag each other down. And um, but then, very concretely, that I want to get to the point with um, where I call blue sky uncensored dreaming. So, to try to name some of the concrete ways, what 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 can we do? You're all going to leave here and go back to different communities and even different countries and so on and say like, how how do you concretely support each other? Um, in fact, on the last page, uh, we have there. These were there weren't any men at this. This was a probably 10 or 15 religious congregations of women, young religious in San Antonio. And they, they just named some things there. They said they're going to try to connect through some kind of Zoom or can you connect to Facebook, FaceTime. But also it said if you're in the same city, celebrations together, movie nights out, bog clubs, dancing, wouldn't exactly be my thing and so on, joint retreats. Or I'll give you an example of what's happening at um, CTU in Chicago this year. But they have a, about 10 or 12 but it's young religious from different congregations. They've given them housing and they live together and study theology together you know, at, at CTU in Chicago. You know, um, you know where, where you, you, you bring, we're already doing that partly with joint like novitiates that are inter-novitiate, but, but they have like probably 10 or 12 young religious men and women living together and making community together even though they belong to different congregations and doing their theology at CTU and having Hilton pay for it. It's a wonderful deal, you know. <laughs> or develop some type of these, I call them AA model groups, like the group I just told you about, these young priests, where you, 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 it doesn't have to be if people are here, but you, you join, you find the young religious or priests or so on, or even be married people who want to live this kind of radical honesty. And you have this, you know, I live with a guy who's an AA guy and has been an AA for 20 years, uh, he goes to meetings twice a week. And he, he maintains a wonderful sobriety and fidelity because he goes to his meetings. He knows if he ever stopped going to his meetings, uh, he'd start drinking. You know, see, so that's another form of support. Now in the United States, and you can Google this, United States, there's, there's, there's um, they may even be holy names. They're out of Portland, I think. Um, they've started a group called, called Giving Voice. You can get, and, and it's a US-based group that's peer-led organization that creates spaces now it's for women, for younger women to give voice to their hopes, dreams, and challenges, and so on. So they do what we've been doing this week, not so much covenant with each other. And I give you the, the website there that you can go and look at. Um, so what I'd like to do tonight, talk first about values. Uh, you know, values of fidelity, prayer, um, and it's, it's support for those of us in this room. So I'm, I'm going to be support you in your religious life. Now, I want to do the first part. Um, I think it can be more brief and it's, it's clear. Then the second part, what I call blue skying on sensor dreaming, you know. I want to, uh, um, you know, tease that term out. You know, um, so much of our, of our when, when we get together and say, well, make suggestions, too often they're all inside the box. <laughs> and everybody's scared to, to dream wild dreams, you know. But they say blue sky. In fact, the, the people who do that, usually they, they put the curtains and say you're supposed to be looking at the sky. So the sky is the limit. Like, uh, don't be afraid to dream out of the box. Maybe it's unrealistic, but sometimes the best ones are, um, they, they can come real and so on. And, um, and also uncensored. It doesn't have to be, well, what are they going to think of me and so on. Um, you know, like. Uh, for instance, an example of blue sky dreaming we did last year, which of course we're not going to do, it's it. What if you all went home and left your congregations? And the 20 of you in this room formed a new congregation, entered the you know, uh, gender congregation. Well, maybe you'd have 20 novices in one year. Maybe not. <laughs> but see, that's an uncensored dream, you know, for which I got royal hell from one of the. the I told that to the Superior General of the Incarnate Word, said, you didn't say that. God, we're going to kill you for saying that. He <laughs> said, don't ever say it to any of our young nuns and so on. OK, well, anyway, um, that's uncensored dreaming. OK, let, let, let's start. In, and I invite you to share, and Michelle's got to mark this down. And um, It doesn't have to be logical or whatever, but with the first uh, And then also tonight. Tonight, when, when, when you go back, um, or sometime before tomorrow night. I'd like you to do the exercise and do it, you know, as, 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 as a major private prayer exercise. And that is spend about 10 minutes first in quiet prayer. 
to get yourself into the space and then with brutal honesty and simply let your heart and your mind flow knowing that nobody else is ever going to read this um, and answer two questions you know first why do I want to go on living that's quite an exercise to ask her, why do you want to continue living what do you still want to do in this life and then why do I want to go on being a religious like like uh, you may have been a religious for a long time but just think why do you want to continue doing this get in touch you know but 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 first of all more widely why do you want to continue living <clears throat> if you died tomorrow what would die in terms of your dreams and so on and I went on a retreat once in Brussels when I was still a student over there and they had us do just that first exercise and uh, and they wanted us to spend about a half a day I felt half an exercise book it was one of the really powerful things I've ever done in my life I never I never sat down and thought, why do I want to keep on living? I was 33 years old at the time, and so I thought I knew. <laughs> but once you just, just poured this out, a very private uh, uh, thing. Like, and then, for us, very important, thing, why do you want to continue being a religious person, like in your side of your congregation? You know, but, but really, just pour those feelings out. Nobody's ever going to read them, but it's a wonderful exercise. So it's, it's an exercise really for it's late tonight, but tomorrow sometime. Just take, take, take an hour sometime and just go to chapel or wherever and, and write this out. And we're not going to ask you to share this. This is, this is for you. You know, you share it with your spiritual director sometime if you want. Okay, let, let's do the first, the, the, on the first round of sharing and that is um, what are the practices of love, prayer and fidelity that we need to commit ourselves to in order to be one heart with each other? <clears throat> 